All right. Welcome to the Philosophy of Lack again. This time it's just me with Alex Ebert. Um, this is sort of like a, a sort of in between of, of, the, of the conversations two and three. And one of the reasons why there's sort of like an in between of the conversations two and three is because there were many points that I think we were touching on in Philosophy of Lack 2 that needed a little more, or at least I sort of like almost selfishly wanted a little more uh, depth to go into them because I thought there was a lot to explore. Um, and, and one of the main things is just this idea of the non-relation, which came up as central, um, as in relationship to, to relationalism. Um, and this idea sort of that got thrown out of like the, the non-relation as the total orgy. So I want to go into this a little more and like, like you emphasize that so strongly and, and sort of we, we've had our own conversations about that behind the scenes. But I, I want to, in order to capture this idea of the non-relation as total orgy and sort of the... <laughs> sort of paradoxes of religious and spiritual social collectives, I want to just use an example from my personal life. So the example I want to use from my personal life is that last summer, I did 5-MeO DMT for the first time. So for anyone who doesn't know, 5-MeO DMT is probably the most powerful psychedelic substance on the planet, and it's something that you just smoke and within five seconds, you're gone. So here I am last summer, sitting down, someone puts a pipe in front of my face. I'm smoking 5-MeO DMT. And within five seconds, there is just, to put it in your language, Alex, there is just this totalizing compression. It's the most totalizing compression possible. and myself is just obliterated. And by totalizing compression, what I mean is just, it felt like every emotion possible, every feeling, every sensation possible, my entire history was being, was, was rushing towards me as myself at once. And I just had to accept all of it. And the metaphor I actually used in a blog post describing the experience is like, before you're smoking, it's like you're standing on Pluto looking at the sun. And after five seconds of smoking, it's like you're at the center of the star. So it's just like this intense, within five or 10 seconds, this intense, hyper gravitational, super gravitational compression of yourself. And then after that experience, you know, as soon as I'm coming out of it, it was like my body was on fire. I was in a total state of, it felt like perfect being, my body's just flaming. And there's just no desire at all in any sense. Um, there's no desire in the sense that I'm already there. Like it's just perfect. And I felt like if my body was just like this constantly, I would just be a totally different type of being. Um, there would be no comparison between the behavior of Cadell as we've known of Cadell. And, and whatever this being is, which is a being that sort of has compressed all of the emotions of his being into a singularity. Now, before I pass it on to you, I want to sort of juxtapose this strange psychedelic experience with like the idea of the non-relation, which is that whenever I go to a religious community, the interesting thing is that all of the people congregating are not having sex like they're they're not they're, they're they've sublimated their sexuality so there's a non-relation there they're they're not that that's sort of like the absence of the space and there's this idea in lacan which is that talking what we're doing right now is a substitute satisfaction for sexuality that you get a sexual enjoyment from the the very act of having conversations like this like it's like like you could say we're mind fucking mm -hmm. you know like and i'm i'm penetrating right now and then when i hand it over to you you're going to be penetrating and i am <laughs> am 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 sort of uh, enjoying yeah. <laughs> sort of thing more openly 
And so like in this idea, I don't know, hope, hopefully what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm talking about makes some sort of sense. I, I wanna sort of make sense of why I, last year I was so infatuated with listening to Osho because what Osho did was situate the actual sexual orgy as part of the process to build divine community. He wasn't saying that the sexual orgy was the divine community because there's a lot of mess that he's dealing with in that orgiastic state. But it's kind of like we need to get through all of those emotions, inclusive of sex, inclusive of violence, in order to bring ourselves to the highest state. And I think that that is what's missing in relationalism is that there's this non-relation, this hyper, this, you could say, perfect being, which we're not, and which we need to sort of work through the absence of that, the lack of that. You know, whether that's through psychedelics, whether that's through going into tantric spaces, whether that's, you know, whatever the mechanism is that you expose yourself to these states where basically your entire identity is destroyed. Like, you know, when you go into a tantric space, the possibility that your entire identity is destroyed is very high. And then you get reconstituted from that. So I, I, let me let me throw that back out to you and see what see where you you're going. With that. When I was really depressed, uh, I was reading Osho a lot. And when I was thinking about leaving AA, I was reading Osho a lot. Uh, I was re reading a lot of sort of that kind of thing. And um, and there was a um, a meditation I may have mentioned to you before uh, that Osho uh, suggested in a very Osho sort of fashion, which was, if you are sad, um, you are not sad enough. Become more sad. No, more sad. No, fuck that, more sad. Fuck that, more. You need to become the sad, no, sadder than that. Sadder, sadder, so sad, so sad that it becomes ridiculous. You need to become ridiculously fucking sad. And I would do this meditation and it would every fucking time as I, I would, I would create this. I would, I would start off with my oscillation of sad and desire and sad and desire, like this sadness of lack and oh, and I'm sad and I don't have it. But then I would compress it and compress it and I'm sadder and I'm sadder and I've heightened the, uh, the, 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 the frequency uh, or, or sort of condensed the frequency and, and heighten the uh, the amplitude and compress it, saturate it. And all of a sudden, what McLuhan calls like a, a, a break boundary or what we would call like a, a quantitative threshold in Hegelian or, or Marxist sort of interpretation of Hegelian terms, that quantitative threshold is surpassed and suddenly something happens and I start fucking laughing. I was sad. And then I became so sad I started laughing because the sadness became ridiculous. It became this new noise floor. It became nothing vis-a-vis -vis total relation. So this idea of nothing, there is no nothing, but there are many little saturation points of total relation that feel like nothing because they're so condensed, they're so saturated, they're so compressed that they sort of, it's not that they disappear, but they compress into, um, into what I'd like to hopefully like reorient people to a new interpretation of what zero actually is, how zeros are made, you know, zero as the new equilibrium. And so I, I become sad, 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 sad. And then all of a sudden I'm starting to laugh and now that's my new equilibrium. You know, I, I, I run through it. Um, and so, yeah, I, I really like this idea of, um, you know, I mean, it's a strange thing to say that if you're sad, you're not sad enough. He didn't say it like that. But the same thing can be done with anger. Absolutely. Anger. Anger, sad. angrier, angrier. Angrier. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. With, with anything. Um, yeah. By the way, the same thing can be done with, uh, with love. Like, you know. Like you can, I love you. I love you. I love, like, I love. So it's like that cartoon, um, you know, uh, I'm going to love you and hug you and love you and smother you. And, and I'll, I'll, you want love. And then someone's loving you so much, you need to get the fuck out. And so there's this sort of like saturation point um, that creates these, these, these break boundaries. Yeah. 
<laughs> I was think thinking, yeah, like that's base. That's basically that that experience that you're describing with sadness. The same thing I've done. I've done that with sadness. I've done that with anger. I haven't yet done that with love, but it makes. But the same. Th the, but the principle applies. And the, the, and the practical experience, because ultimately here, we might be talking about something very metaphysical, but we're also talking about something deeply practical, yeah. you know, for that people are, you know, someone's depressed. What do you, what do you do? Like you go to a doctor and, and the, they're going to throw pills at you. They're not going to say, get sadder. They're right. going right. to gonna throw, they're going to throw pills at you. So, so we're talking about something that's concrete. We're talking about something that, that is deeply practical and like when and you know this idea just popped into my mind just now about love that i've i have had the practical problem of both myself loving someone too much and mm. also being loved too much mm. and what and what do you do mm. like it's it's not easy it's 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 a very difficult situation to be in and and yeah. how do you deal with that you know and you know from our last conversation you were saying you know when you are love, you basically don't need ethics anymore. So like when I'm thinking about the space of when I love too much or if I'm being loved too much, I, I think about this as an ethical problem, but you just need to be more love. Right. You know, like you need to be more love, more love, more love to the point of absurdity, because if you just think about it too much, you can never get out. Yeah. It seems you can never get out. I, at least in terms of thinking about it, it's like you just you would circle around the same lack and you wouldn't compress it to the level that it needs to be compressed in order to get to a different lack in this language. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's also this idea of like, um, you know, so with love, like, I, and I think this is an interesting topic is like, um, loving too much. I think that's a very challenging topic um, because obviously we've been entrained with the idea of, um, of that being impossible and love being sort of like, you know, this endless bucket. And, um, and that, that idea of um, getting to the next lack and in the context of love, and, and maybe this is maybe also in the context of, you know, uh, sexual addiction or um, or love addiction, let's say, uh, the fetishization of love, so that you feel like you have to, you know, if, if love is something that you want to get out of, this is a perfect technique to love so much, to, to exhaust your love for someone by, by over loving, um, or um, to fall out of love by having someone love you too much and, um, and to exhaust it in that sense. But you know, one of the ways in which love um, continues and persists, you know, in a sort of extra elongated fashion tends to be, in my experience, when there are a lot of intermittencies uh, that pertain to the love or to the affair, so that there's sort of like, you know, you're loving and then you go on a break or you go on a trip and you don't see each other and then you come back and there's these sort of, these breaks that disallow that compression. And, I love that. Yeah. So well, that's my favorite. Yeah. I, I think, I think, I think, I think, you, I think, I think that that, I think if I was to say an ethical principle for long term relationships, they have to include lack. They have to include, or maybe a better word, they have to include a gap that allows two to be two. Because they're, ha because while we're not in a total relation, like, because, we're talking, we're talking about how to main, if you're talking about main, that this is where in terms of maintaining a relation, yeah. long-term relation, yeah. you have to include the non-relation, meaning the gap, and that the gap is informing the relation, allowing the relation to exist in time. And, and okay, so uh, uh, something just popped into my mind when you said this. Okay, so um, just to introduce everyone very briefly to the, the idea of the desired outcome being something that we, we imagine. Uh, let's say we imagine the perfect uh, relationship and we project our attention into it and we find someone and we think, oh my God, I'm, we're going to get married and we're going to do it. And we have this sort of like ideal outcome and that sort of exists 
on the far side of the equation of our relationship. And so we're getting along and we're trying, we're starting to approach this ideal. And as we approach this ideal, and as we put more attention onto the far side of that equation, we embed that projection with um, more and more gravity. And that projection itself starts to pull us in. It starts to attract us in. And that starts to create the compression. And so we start to compress and compress and compress and compress. And as we approach the, the vision, we start to compress more. And then we ruin totally the vision so the way so so the gap that you're describing may actually be the negation of the projection so to avoid having a projection to avoid putting our attention into a projection and instead simply live in the oscillation so that the oscillation itself can sort of indefinitely oscillate and come here and go there and to avoid creating that projection, that idealistic vision that we put our attention to. Because as soon as we start putting attention into that idealistic vision on the far side of the equation, it starts to gain gravity and it starts yes. to pull us in. So there's a there's an equation that our, our sort of our collaborator in this series, OG Rose, often says, which is um, X, he says, X wants Z. X does Y to get Z, and Y is why X doesn't get Z. Right. So that formula describes exactly what you're saying with the projection is you project an ideal. That ideal is so that basically the ideal is Y, and you're doing the projection so you get Z, in this case, the ideal outcome. But the projection is why you don't get the ideal outcome. Right, because the projection gains this sort of force. It, it takes you away from the real. So you're not really interacting with the other person anymore. And that's why you don't get the ideal outcome. You don't get the ideal outcome because you're not, not even interacting with the other person. You're not letting life be life. You're not letting, you're not moving. See, the absolute knowledge is that you're capable of moving with the uncertainty in your own self-certainty. But with the projection, you're actually trying to eliminate the uncertainty. Because yeah, you're, de you're demanding that there's this ideal outcome. Yeah, and if, if we could think about it spatially, when we put out this projection, there's an arrival point. So let's say that arrival is a wall. Like, let's just imagine that, that that's, a, that's a point in space that once we arrive, it's a threshold of some sort. And we project that out there. And so now the space, let's say the space is time and our trajectory and our relationship. Now we only have so much space before we get to whatever this outcome is. There is some sort of arrival. And as we begin to approach it, we have less and less space. So suddenly it's like, well, well we're supposed to get married in five years. And so this time starts to compress and our frequencies and, and, and the expectations begin to compress. And that compression in and of itself erases the, the dynamism of the relationship. So you have these waveforms, you have these waveforms that are intermittent and it looks very much like life and dynamic. And then you start to get, as you approach this wall, well, it starts to become like this. Oh, we have to do everything together. We have to. <laughs> go on a walk. You're going on a walk. I gotta go on a walk. Let's let's just make it okay. And because we're gonna hit this wall, and then as soon as you 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 compress that, you end up with literally frequency wise it's, nothing. It's it's a it's a premature eradication of time. Yes, yes, it's a, it's, it's, it's a premature errat. Not not saying that okay, maybe we can speculate at the end of all time. A time is gonna come to an end, but we have like while we're in time, while we are time. It's a fabrication of of, uh, of of yes of the end of time, <laughs> and 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 the thing is is exactly and and that the end of time it's interesting. So here, let me just be open, mysterious. I, I have no idea. It's interesting that the human being tends to structurally, at least, let's say, adult human beings, and I like this notion of one of my favorite philosophers, Alenka Zupanchich, says, is where do adults come from? You know, not not children, not where do children come from? Where do adults come from? We have adult adult human beings that tend to structurally 
try to eradicate time with an other human of the opposite sex usually, or it can just be a sexual partner, yeah. but they try to eradicate time with this other. Yeah. Why, why do we do that? Why do we do that? Because society, like what we think of as society, what we think of as human civilization is underlying it is this sexual behavior, this tendency for adults to concentrate so much energy, to concentrate so much um, time and attention in this projection of the end of time that they never really live and they never really relate. So it's, why do we do that? What would society look like if we stopped doing that and matured that process a little bit? Because it seems to me absurd hmm. that you could, that metaphysically, that you should try to eradicate time itself in an other human being of the opposite sex. Like we just take that as a, as a almost for granted that we do that. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, so, so in, in the, in the graph that, that, you know, that I've been sending around. Um, so if everyone just imagines a, a waveform and then the waveform starts to compress and those frequencies are happening so frequently now that actually it ends up looking like one big fat line. So that's the sort of compression that we're talking about. So you have these waveforms and then they're happening like this and they're happening so much that it's just one flat fat line. If we you could say of, like when uh, the waveforms are very when the waveforms are spaced out, it's like you're 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 single or you're you know and then they get more <laughs> compressed it's more into this eradication of time. Well, so to 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 talk Lacanian for a moment like this and then this so the peak here and a peak here these are differential elements differential waves there's this wave oh and then there's this wave i felt we went to the park and then we went over here and i and i had some depression i had some this and i i, I experienced this sort of array differential elements but when these waveforms are packed there's no longer any way to differentiate one thing from the other now if we thought of time, and they become unanalyzable, but if we thought of time as the space between uh, differential elements, you know, as the sort of measurement between, which is how you sort of measure time along the x-axis. So you have the waveform and then the waveform. And so time sort of marks these events. But as these waveforms, the frequency starts to increase. Well, from the outside, time is just the same. But from the inside, these things are happening much quicker. And so our desire to sort of compress is literally an effort to like to negate time because the, the more that these frequencies happen within the same strands of time, um, the more they become timeless. So at, at, at Planck length, like at the smallest scale imaginable, uh, at the, the smallest compressions in the universe, we're like at the very center of black holes. Um, Time is basically compressed down to nothing. Um, you know, at, at, at light speed, you know, time essentially sort of almost stops um, because it's going so fast. So this idea of trying to unify with someone, if we thought about it as waveforms, my waveform and your waveform compressing, it is sort of an effort to try and negate time. And this idea of timelessness and eternalizing ourselves um, is so powerful and the question of like can we slow it down can we just negate that desire um fuck i i just you know it, it's it's interesting i'm not i'm just it's it's just it's the question it's it's i uh, think object i think objectively it can be negated and sublimated because there are human beings that do it but they're very few now I, I I just I I would just I would just say that historically there are very few like for example I don't know how accurate this is but I don't know how accurate this is but I I know Sad Guru who's a, an Indian mystic an Indian yogi uh -huh. um, said that historically seventy percent of Indian society would get married in a traditional marriage structure with a man and a woman and thirty percent of Indian society would go off and to become basically a monastic life. So like there's a basically 30% of historical Indian society goes to a monastic life. Again, I don't know how accurate these exact statistics are, but just expressing that historically speaking, there are a fragment of human beings or a percentage of human beings 
that try to sublimate this energy to some higher order spiritual practice. Um, now, I started off this conversation by sort of suggesting that, you know, with the psychedelic practice, you basically are transported to the thing just almost automatically. With 5-MeO-DMT, it's just like automatically you're there. Now, after 15 minutes, you're back into your normal body. You're back and communicate about this to everyone. You know, so so how common is it going to be for human beings in general to play around with the possibility of transcending and sublimating? Well, yeah, I, I, I forgot that we were talking in the context of just like, you know, relationship. But but absolutely, I, I guess what I'm asking is, <laughs> can the whole desire be negated? Like, is there a negation of the negation of the negation in the sense that? Yes, how far does that loop go? Yeah, because of course, like those monks, they're just going off. I mean, I have those desires. I, I feel like that's what eventually I'm going to end up. I'm going to end up being that guy who lives alone in a tree or whatever. And that's going to be like, my, <laughs> you know, at my ultimate. Um, but that's going to also be my ultimate union. I mean, my desire to do that is a desire to unionize myself with the universe or with something larger or whatever. It's still that desire to achieve that sort of eternalized state, but at some sort of like, grander scale or whatever um so i guess yeah you know, what baffles me is why that desire in the first place what what's so fucking great about eternalizing ourselves and i guess that's what comes back that's why i keep coming back to this idea that maybe it's because we came from that state like just how we want to get back in the womb we want to get back to that compressed state from once the big bang to be orgiastic uh where we came i from. guess I guess on, on, on the individual level, I interpret this to be simply a metaphor for the womb because now on an individual level, let's just start there before going out to a cosmic level. On an individual level, I think obviously it's, it's the, the memory of the womb because like my body had its genesis. My actual body was in a weird womb position for, for months. Like th that was my starting position. And, and there are certain characteristics about that womb state that are diametrically opposed to my condition as a organism in the world. Namely that I'm much more unsafe in the world. I have to do much more work in the world in order to get my needs met. So it makes sense that there's this spontaneous desire to obliterate that condition and return to the original pre-birth state. Sure. Now, on, now on a cosmic level, we could get more speculative, which is that every single org organism that's ever been produced is a split from one into two, like between a split into organism and environment, which you could trace back to the Big Bang, potentially, if you would like want to get really speculative about it. And that there's some deep cosmo-ontological principle that's being invoked by the very expression of the desire to uni unify with this transcendental state. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I of course, it's, 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 it's much more sort of grounded to focus on the womb. Um, and, and you I'm could happy, take it to the universe I'm happy, as a whole. I'm happy to stay there. I mean, you know, uh, it, it's, sort of, it's sort of irrelevant. There, there, th there's that desire regardless. And if we stay, I think the problem in thinking cosmologically is that then, you know, we get sort of away from the anthrop anthropocentric sort of uh, uh, analysis and we start to think, okay, now, does that mean all matter lacks? And then that does that mean that all matter has consciousness? Because obviously to lack means to sort of have mind of some sort. So this <laughs> this is this is this is something that I, I wouldn't mind touching on because the very first academic article I ever wrote, which was just speculative and for myself, was this idea of the desire to see other intelligent organisms in the universe. Like I wanted to see what other intelligent organisms in a different, totally different evolutionary context would look like and how they would be behaving. So our cosmological hypothesis would basically be a desire to know the metaphysics for intelligent beings as such. Like do all intelligent beings have this desire because it's because basically we're all connected to the birth of the universe itself? Do you know what I mean? Like, but that, that's just a speculative hypothesis. We have no way to test it. I mean, look, I, I almost feel like, you know, what I'm about to say is like coming out anti-vax or something. But um, basically, <laughs> basically, 
in my in my fantasy of of everything is that everything expresses as far as i can tell everything expresses some sort of desire to complexify and whether that's gravity or what what is, why why is the single celled organism not happy being single celled and why did it need to become multicellular all, all of these um, sort of why did things begin to clump again after the dispersal of the Big Bang? Um, these these hypothetical um, sort of conditions of compression, where everywhere we see these compressions. I mean, that's what my body is, is a fucking compression of a bunch of matter. And, um, and then we're going to sort of see that dispersal in whatever my entropic end is. And, um, and so I don't mind um, imagining... Uh, for a moment, just because I'm not, look, I'm not religious in the sense that like, I don't have, I'm not, I don't have like an orthodoxy. So this is my fantasy. So like, and I think that that I, I deserve my fucking fantasy. So I'm going to claim my fucking fantasy, which is that yes, all things experience sort of uh, this lack desire drive and that that explains the, the clumping of things and this sort of desire to reunite, to disperse, and that everything really is this sort of orgiastic, um, uh, you know, phantasm of of a return um, from some sort of uh, congestion, and and it, it, it's it's what's fun about this hypothesis anyway is that it actually does hold up. You can map it over anything. Sure, it's totally hypothetical, but. Um, but I do think that it makes a lot of sense um, in in a sort of religious uh, sense, you know. And when when we have these, by the way, when we have these experiences, I, I did five D uh, or whatever the DMT that you smoke. It was totally yeah. accidental. I was like, "Do you have any weed?" They're like, "Yeah, the weed's in the thing." I was about to smoke. He's like, "Oh no, that's DMT." I was like, "Dude," he's like, "Smoke it." I was like, "Okay," so I so I just smoked DMT on 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 a whim. Um, and it was uh, very, very, it was similar to what you're saying. And, you know, the, the talk that you had with OG bros about absolute knowing and this sort of thing, and how do you create, how do you solve this subject object, you know, uh, dilemma? It's like, well, then by becoming both, you know, it's like by disappearing into the thing and the thing disappearing into you and, and that moment of, um, of totality, um, but this, but this, this, to me, the crucial thing here is, okay, we have the possibility to obliterate the subject object distinction in the psychedelic smoking 5-MeO DMT. But the crucial thing to me about absolute knowing is, is that you are able to be in that state while you're in this world, like right now, like I'm in that state. What you know, like then I, like I'm I, I I can carry that state with me ever everywhere. Like like I like like even for example with your example of um I think that my destiny is I'm going to be um, a guy in a tree. What did you say? <laughs> I'm going to be the yeah. guy that lives alone in a tree. Yeah, well, would be like, yeah, yeah, like that. Like, but like, like, like the Zarathustra like character who just goes off into the woods and stuff like that, and he's a crazy wild madman. Mm -hmm. But he's like got the absolute knowing. Is like, I think the, the the real absolute knowing is is that you're capable of holding that consciousness but you're capable of being in, you know, what OG Rose was emphasizing as the common life. Like, like you're in the common life, but you, but you're with the absolute knowing at the same time. Sure. Sure. Is That's that possible? Awesome. Is that possible? Like that I is, I, well, when you analyze, for example, Nietzsche's writing, Nietzsche had a lot of trouble with that. Well, there's this guy, um, uh, uh, Leonard Orr, I think is his name. And he has this sort of, he was like an Esalen guy and he did this like rebirthing breathing. It's incredible. It's like, <sighs> I don't know if anybody's, there. but by the way, speaking of doing something until some, until there's a break boundary, when you do this sort of like intense, <sighs> you, you start shaking and then you start crying. You start going back in, in your history. It's this incredible effect, but anyone look up Leonard Orr and rebirthing. But, um, he said he went on this quest to find all these immortals and he found one immortal. It was like in the mountains of the Himalayas. He said, what's your secret? He says, avoiding humanity because yes, is it possible? Sure. But I, I think it's a bit of a cop out. Every time I think about like, yes, and you can 
you can do that and have your realization and live in society. It's like, there's something about that that feels fallacious. I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure if I buy that. Um, I, I what, think that what, what, idea what, what is it about it that feels fallacious? You cannot participate in a lie and be the truth. That's what feels fallacious. That's what Nietzsche was struggling with. That's exact. That's how I, I feel like Nietzsche would agree with you 100%. Yeah, you, you, you cannot, you, you just can't. I mean, you can, but then, but to be the truth in the lie means you become the distortion, means you're immediately arrested or you're put in jail or whatever happens to you. Eventually. That's the thing. That's the thing. Like, for example, Socrates was killed. Right. Exactly. Like, uh, and like, 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 for example, we have a figure like Socrates being killed. You have a, a, what I was trying to emphasize in the conversation with OG was that to be this type of subject, you also have to factor in the, the fact that it's actually very dangerous for you to try and do it. Yes. Like it's, it's like you could be killed, like you could, or or you could be, or you could be, you know, like, like you're saying, you, 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 you become the distortion. And, and like, basically the idea here is that if you're the absolute knowledge as this distortion to the others, that you are just this mirror that is reflecting the others back to themselves. And, and, and there's a possibility in that act that you can actually improve society. And I think OG would make the case that society needs such heroic acts. Sure, you have the heroic return and you bring the knowledge back and you try and teach people and better them. But while you do it, the thing that you sort of um, risk is your own, um, your own truth. And so you, you sully your own truth for the sake of, um, for the sake of improving humanity to some extent or, or whatever the case. And, and yet, to what extent, you know, to what extent is that a, is that a, um, a cover for your own desire to simply live in the lie and experience some of the, uh, the beauty of the lie? Because the lie has, has, some of the, has some of that beauty, you know, and, and the fantasies and all that. Um, I'm not sure, you know, it's just... Yeah, it's hard to know. It's, it's just a hunch. Um, yeah, well, it's, very, it's very hard to know. Well, I, let, me, let me give a metaphor that I, I actually used in a recent presentation, that of like basically Frodo, and this might, might sound silly at first, but Frodo, 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 and the, Frodo and the ring and his adventure and his coming back to the Shire. And actually that when he came back to the Shire, he couldn't stay in the Shire. He had to be taken to a land, you know, with the elves, mm. which is a mysterious land of the immortals, basically. Mm. Um, but he couldn't stay in his homeland in the Shire. And so I right. like this idea that, once you have the absolute knowledge, once you've been through the journey, actually it's difficult or impossible to return and that you have to go off to a different qualitative realm. And this would be the realm of the immortals or the, the realm of, of the impossible itself. Here's, a, here's an idea I like. We talked about this before, a little bit in terms of the guru being on the other side of the equation. The minus x plus x equals zero. Can you, let, let's explain that for the for the for the viewers. Ex, maybe explain that as a preface. Sure. Um, so it's just a sort of mathematical fact that that minus x plus x equals zero. It's just random, super simple, um, you know, math. Um, but in the context of becoming or the context of self or the context of sort of, you know, envisioning a future for yourself, you feel a lack of X, whatever X is, you feel a lack of that. So you try and acquire that and that equals zero once you acquire it. <laughs> right. And so that becomes interesting. Why does it equal zero? Why doesn't it equal X? Why does it equal zero? So if it equals zero, then what exactly is zero, which then, you know, brings us on this sort of path to where well, you can get rid of the X and just go minus plus equals zero. So just this oscillation, enough of the oscillation equals that, you know, creates the compression. And so that zero is actually enough of the minus X plus X equals a compression of that oscillation, which is zero. So for instance, as an example, uh, an example McLuhan likes to give is that at Mach speed, which is like 345 meters per second or something, um, right before you hit Mach speed and break the sound barrier, um, 
and create the sonic boom, sound waves become visible, visible to the pilots, and then the sound barrier is broken, and then you enter this sort of the speed of sound. Um, that would be sort of an example of that threshold after which you have this sort of new um, equilibrium, this new zero around which you're oscillating and you go faster over that. Um, anyhow, um, fuck, where was I? What was I explaining? Basically the guru as Not like the guru. magnetic zero on the yes. other side of the right, equation. Right. Okay, so, so let's say we have this equation a lack minus x plus x. Now, why do you feel that minus x? Let's why do you say that the guru, the, the guru, the ultimate embodiment of the filling of the lack? Right, but right, exactly. For so, these so, individuals. So you, right, so you have this minus x, but the question is that lack, that lack of I'm missing this. Where does that come from? And 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 possibly it comes part and parcel with a vision over here on the other side of the equation of something else, something that you're missing, the thing that you're missing. And if the guru is presenting that thing, the guru is sitting there being like this, I am at this enlightened state that you are not. Wouldn't you like to be at my state? Wouldn't you like to cross the threshold of this equation? Cross the break boundary by meditating enough or by going to India enough or by doing such and such enough, or by saying, I'm sad, I'm sad, I'm sad, enough. Whatever the case is, the guru is on the other side of the equation as the sort of vision instigating your lack, letting you know there is something else that you are not experiencing that he embodies or she or they embody that you could be if only. And, um, God damn it, I've lost, so, so the guru as the, where the fuck was I with the, we were talking about the the. Anyway, I guess we, 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 we were we were talking we were talking about the, about the heroic return. Ah, the hor heroic return. Like whether whether or not like so like like to to basically situate what you're saying in what we were talking about before was like a figure like Osho made the decision to come back, and right. he made a decision to sort of put himself into a realm of common human beings. He decided to make himself the embodiment of this lack pulling people towards this transcendent state whereas you're saying if i was in that state i might just go off and become a, a, a right. isolated and i guess i guess the, the the beauty of instigating the lack so you show up as the zero as the next you know as the as the thing that's on the other side of the equation and you instigate the lack by coming back as this sort of enlightened being you instigate that i come back as jesus and i make everyone sort of be like oh my god i need that Oh my God, I need what Osho has. I need what this thing has. I need that vision. And so you come back as uh, the enlightened being instigating lack everywhere and uh, uh, catalyzing that oscillation of minus X plus X minus X plus X. I'm going to meditate, meditate. I want it. I want it. I need to be there. I'm going to work out. You have this workout guru being, look at me, how strong I am, how healthy, look at my glow. And you instigate these lacks. I mean, this is everywhere. This is Instagram. This describes Instagram, right? Um, Although like with the, like the, the, like the difference with the Instagram model or what, whatever the, let's say the influencer is that act, Actually, their inner being is actually, in most cases, I'm generalizing, but in sure. most cases, their inner being is actually extremely shallow and their image is very attractive, but it's a very superficial image with nothing really deeply behind it. Whereas with a figure like Osho, the, 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 the wager is, is that their inner being is actually not deceiving you. Yes. Yes, that's that's the gamble you take. And unfortunately, because of all of those deceptions, now anyone, you know, any guru is just that's why, you know, my moniker is sort of bad guru because there's so many bad gurus out there. So anyway, it's a great uh, moniker. <laughs> so, you know, I, it, this is this is interesting in the context of trust, um, because when the zero shows back up, when the hero shows back up, the enlightened being shows back up and in, it catalyzes the lack in everyone. There's a certain amount of distrust now in the sort of post um, modern era where you feel like you're being proselytized. You feel like you don't trust the person at the end, other end of the equation and you feel like you're gambling yourself by just, you know, embedding yourself with their with their enlightenment. Um, but if you do walk off 
And I guess you'd have to have a subtle desire that someone finds you or you create an occlusion or a mystery school where you're not proselytizing, but rather people find out about you and they come to you and somehow they have, you know, their own discovery towards you. Um, I guess that's, I guess that's more, I guess that's preferable, but um, can I give you, can I give you, can I give you the example that, that Osho himself used? He said that I attract people in a feminine way, not in a phallic way, meaning that I don't go out looking for people to, uh, I don't go out like looking for people to get, I wait for people to come to me. I, and I don't, and I, I, I I'm not looking necessarily for people. I'm just being myself naturally how I am. And if yeah. people find me, they find me. Yeah. But Osho was consumed in a conflagration of his own ego because he came back. So I think that that's, and I think ultimately that's his heroism. His heroism was um, allowing whatever enlightenment he had found to be fucking decimated by his association with a bunch of fucking humans. Um, but he would, he, would, he would say that enlightenment is inclusive of this decimation because he would say that, that his enlightenment was stronger than the sex and the violence occurring around him. And that if your enlightenment is not strong enough to handle the sex and the violence occurring around you, then you're not really enlightened. If your enlightenment is- Does that make sense? If you're like, he, like, he, like he would, he would say, for example, of someone who says they were a meditation master, but they were sort of, they still had a, a fear or a repulsion to, for example, sexual activity or power or violence. True. That this would be proof that actually their meditation was a cover for, or a defense against the real of sex and violence and power, that they weren't actually capable of withstanding these phenomena. Whereas he would, he would say that my meditation's stronger than sex. It doesn't matter. I could be in an orgy or I could not be in an orgy. It's not a problem. It doesn't affect me because my meditation's stronger than this orgy anyway. I could be in it. I can be in it. Well, I think that that's the key. This is the either or oscillation the ideal oscillation in some ways is that either or, like a take it or leave it sort of oscillation. And, um, and, and also in relationship, you know, of course, that's not what any, you know, monogamous relationship really wants to hear. It's not, it's not satisfying the, the need for safety, but, um, but it does keep the dynamism um, and potentially avert any, necess necess any necessary compression. I think that's the crucial thing for both absolute knowing and enlightenment is this notion of safety is that actually when you're in the absolute knowledge, you're already safe no matter what. Mm. Like you're safe, you're safe. There's nothing that can disturb you. Like the meaning being that the crucial thing is that when you're in the absolute knowledge, you can withstand any disturbance because you're already safe. Like it, it, to the to the most extreme level, like this is a thought experiment I had and I, I've only said it once, but I think it's an interesting thing to think is that if you're truly a Buddha, like the ultimate test of your Buddhahood would be that you'd wake up one morning and the entire universe would be different and you would be nonplussed. Yeah. Like, like, oh, I woke up and the entire coordinates of the dim dimensions of my universe are different. Yeah. And, and, and you're, and you're still self-similar yeah like you're not surprised by it because you've included the ultimate surprise into your own identity yeah yeah there's that there's 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 and there's another way to look at it which is that you wouldn't be surprised if you were different if you woke up and you were completely different somehow there's this there's this you know this supersymmetry, this this com comfortability with the with the supersymmetry that, that that I am both, and um, exactly, yeah, yeah. So I guess like to bring it back around to where I felt the conversation was ending in our last discourse, it's that to me is that when I hear people talking about relationalism. It's not including the fact that this potential, this super symmetrical otherness and the potential within everyone for the super symmetrical otherness as the non-relation has to be factored into the way we constitute our relations. Everyone. 
Because no matter where you are in the oscillation, quote unquote, say you're in the oscillation of man and woman, or say you're in the oscillation of the divine society itself, it's a different oscillation. But wherever you are in the oscillation, meaning wherever you are in the set of relations, those relations are being constituted by the non-relation, by the supersymmetry. Now they're being constituted in a different way because the individuals relating are relating differently to this impossibility. They've integrated more otherness. Now, the other hypothesis, and this is a little further down the, the, my, my line of thinking, and is that it's possible for an individual to actually be the non-relation as such, in which case their entire relationship to the oscillations is different. And that's the absolute knowing. <clears throat> yeah, I'm starting to think that I'm starting to think that um, that this non this this state of non projection, you know, it's like this phrase I I, I like saying. Um, I don't want to master life. I want life to master me. And in fact, I generally have a lot of fucking problem. I'm always, <laughs> whenever, whenever anyone's like, a, especially in relationship, but anytime is like, uh, well, what's our intention? I, I, I fucking, my, my whole body like convulsed. I'm like, ugh, like, I don't want a fucking intent. Please. Like, I just want, I, I want to, to throw my fucking head through a brick whenever I hear anything it's, about intention. It's the, it, it's the funniest when people are going into a psychedelic session saying, set uh, your intention. Set your intention. Like, you're set the your intention. God. Like, like, who are you? What the heck? Shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you, man. I'm with you. Um, like, let the intention speak itself. That's you know, what I'm saying. Become a vessel, clear your intentions, get rid totally. of your Totally. Get rid of your intentions. Yeah. Fuck your intentions. Fuck the intention. <laughs> Fuck the projection of the ideal. Stop that projection of the ideal. Stop aiming. Totally. Stop aiming. Clear yourself and allow the oscillation to go. Un yeah. Unfucking mitigate. <laughs> and I think that... Um, then in some ways, that's what we're talking about here with the absolute knowing, absolute knowledge is, is the allowance of the oscillation to, to move itself unimpeded and unguided by your own uh, projections. So that maybe the ultimate is the non-arrival, the non-arrival. So that we're not going from one magnetic zero to the next magnetic zero to the next magnetic zero, but that the and and if those mag, you know ascending transcending these things are are probably inevitable but the kind of transcendences the zeros the magnetic zeros that i want to meet are ones that surprise me are ones that happen through a naturalized oscillation um that essentially a god Hood moving through me or a universalized energy that is just sort of happening so that everything so that the trajectory I'm on is sort of uh, has been naturalized or more along the lines of what you're describing is an oscillation that really sort of never ends um, you know and, and I don't know if that's sort of like what Mikel was referring to as like the spurious infinity but maybe it's not so spurious I mean maybe oscillation that doesn't equal zero is a, is a state that can be maintained so long as you don't project, so long as you don't have that sort of idealized fascination. I don't know. Well, I, I, I do think the way you're describing absolute knowledge is how I understand it, where you basically have this allowance for an, for, for an oscillation, which is unimpeded and unguided by your own ideal projection, because that's the desire which gets you in the loop of the spurious infinity. The idea of the spurious infinity is like, it's basically like the, yes. your, it's, it's that the ideal never arrives. Okay. Like well, the, the spurious, like the, here, let me put it in simple terms with your equation. Cause you have X, X sorry. Minus X, X plus X minus X, X minus plus X minus X equals zero. Minus X lack desire equals zero. Yeah. 
which is which to me I always give, and I gave in the first philosophy of lack the example of the Nike shoe or the McDonald's burger. The idea of the spurious infinity to me is we can just use this example of you want a pair of shoes, you idealize the Nike pair of shoes, you go to the mall, you buy the Nike pair of shoes, you come home and you still feel the lack. Sure. The, the idea is, is that there's never going to be an object of desire outside of you that fulfills this. It's just a spurious infinity. It goes on forever. You could, you could, and there are dudes, this is not a weird example because there are dudes with thousands of shoes. Oh yeah. There are dudes with thousands of Nike shoes <laughs> and this, and this, and this, that's a, that's a perfect example of the spurious infinity. It never ends. There will never be the Nike shoe, which ends sure. this process. So the absolute knowing is like you're on the others. It's basically that you realize that the Nike shoe in this example or the, you know, for someone who has a food addiction, it could be literally the McDonald's burger. Like there are people say, say someone has a food addiction where they have this thing, this food that they just need to keep eating every day. It could be the McDonald's burger. It could be whatever it is, a bag of chips that you really like, but sure. it just never ends. And so like the absolute knowledge is you actually get to the point where whatever this weird energy you're projecting out into the universe and attaching to and repeating becomes internalized because you're that thing. Right. So, so, so just so, so that I'm brings an end to the spurious infinity. Right. And just so that this was a, a, a mental trip that I was having and maybe other people are having while listening. I'm not sure. So in the Hege Hegelian sense, the repetition of that desire, unfulfilled desire sort of loop is spurious and it's infinite. So it's not that it's the infiniteness of it is spurious. It's actually infinite. It's and a it's, bad infinity. It's a bad infinity. It's yeah, a not a true infinity. It's a judgment on infinity. <laughs> yeah. But it's, but it's not that it's not infinity. It's just a bad infinity. The idea, as I understand it, is that there's two, again, this is Hegel, so it's always dialectical. There's a dialectics between bad infinity and true infinity, where bad infinity is this never-ending process of desire. Yeah. Like I was just describing with the Nike shoe or the McDonald's burger, you can insert whatever object you like. It could, so, also, be, it could also be with a musical or, an, or a professional identity. Like, so for example, like if you put so much of yourself into this professional identity, like it could be in the music sphere, or for me, it could be in the philosophy sphere, where you think that you're going to achieve this identity at some point and you'll be fulfilled. Right. This is the bad infinity. Yeah. But the true infinity is that you internalize this whole process and that's when desire becomes drive. Mm. And that's true infinity. Mm. And then you're and then you are almost the magnetic zero. You're on the other side of the oscillation. Right. Like then you, so I'm asking you become this magnetic zero. And then I'm saying, are there deeper levels of zero? Are there deeper levels of lack? Mm. Like, do you know what I mean? Like you just keep going deeper into the process, but maybe what would a community of such magnetic zeros look like? <laughs> yeah. Like instead of like, instead of you, for example, instead of you living in a, uh, in a tree by yourself when you're, 55 years old what if there was a what if there was a community of magnetic zeros what would that look like right right well there'd be a community of me's because you know all the me's we become uh they're sublated so all these zeros are, are sublating one into the next and then one into the next and so you, so you start to compress your own core you become magnetic um because you're you know continuing along this path of uh of acquiring these uh, these zeros, um, and in 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 regards to magnetism, what we're saying basically is, and I'm just using these examples as general. You can insert your very own, you know, little perversion, let's say. But it's like, you know, the the Nike shirt, the McDonald's burger is magnetic. It's magnetizing you. It's getting oh, yeah. you to move. It's getting you to move. It's getting you oh, to yeah. like, or or if you're this particular musical identity, why are you singing and creating and performing and dancing? It's all this magnetism. So yeah. we're just saying that you as a core become this magnetic thing. Yeah. And, yeah, and, yeah, and, exactly. and the mystery is you're still moving and you're moving, but you're moving by different principles. What are those principles? Mm. Yeah. 
I mean, the, 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 the cheeseburger creates as much FOMO as the legitimate, um, you know, guru. So it becomes oh, totally uh, it, <laughs> the onus oh. is on the follower. So for the for for the fault fo- like for like for the average human being, like their guru might be a cheeseburger. Yeah. Like, but like, but for, but for someone who's like, for example, and we're just using this as a, as an archetypal example, if you like, but it gets more complex, but like for the follower of Osho, they're magnetized by Osho in the same way that someone else is magnetized by a cheeseburger. Mm-hmm. Like it, it's just something else is moving them. Now we could say that on the oscillation of the person who's magnetized by the cheeseburger versus the person who's magnetized by Osho, they're at a different level of oscillation. Because the one who's magnetized by the cheeseburger is on a level of a basic food drive. Whereas the person who's magnetized by the Nike shoe is being magnetized by a certain social recognition drive. Whereas the person who's being magnetized by Osho is being magnetized by a certain divine society drive. Because you're looking for the divine society. Looking for the divine society is different than looking for a cheeseburger. What do you think about, back to this idea of like, you know, not projecting a, a zero or an ideal across the end of the equation by which, you know, which catalyzes the lack, desire, drive, but the idea of negating, you know, the ideal or, or refusing to sort of, um, to envision an ideal and instead sort of just, you know, being in the moment, uh, letting life master you or whatever. And just suspending disbelief for a moment, that oscillation being able to conti- uh, be continued ad nauseum because, you know, without an arrival point, without any um, transcendent, that that is in and, of, in and of itself sort of the transcendence, that you become just a state of dynamism at all times that never compresses, that never ends up sort of um, aggressing itself into a compression. Would that in and of itself be... Uh, just merely a negation that needs to be negated? So my personal understanding and how I understand negation of the negation on, on the Hegelian level is that the ultimate compression and the ultimate arrival point is death. Yeah, so, well. so, you, so, so you know you're going to die and when you say let life master you, what you're trying to do is to die as well as possible. And that you're trying to, and, I, and, and there's video footage of this because Osho tried to do it. His whole goal was to be as aware as possible when he was going to confront his death. Mm. He wanted to be so aware when he died that he would, that, that that's how aligned he was with otherness, with difference. Mm with the obliteration of himself. And my hypothesis would be that when I've tasted the other side in psychedelics, it's like an identity death. Maybe it is like death. I know, for example, I use the example in my conversation with OG is that my grandfather who passed away last year, um, he had a near death experience before he died a week before he died, where he literally said that when he died he clinically died and was brought brought back to life that he was just in a blinding bright light of Mm. compression Mm. so 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 the idea is is that you suspend all belief you negate all ideals in the worldly realm but you've you've sort of emotionally accepted your own finitude you've emotionally accepted your own mortality and you are living in relationship to that other as the ultimate compression. So that's the negate. So that's the negation of negation. Sure. Sure. Like, like that's, that's the motor of the negation of the negation. Sure. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, every one of these, um, a flat line, just to explain it. So, so a flat line is death, right? Typically we see a flat line and then a heartbeat, flat line is death. Now, if you have these oscillations and they compress really fast and then they start to just look like a flat line, also death. So that drive itself is the death drive. 
every time. So you get that. You want the cheeseburgers over here on the other side of the equation. You start oscillating. Oh, I want the cheeseburger. I'm getting closer to the cheeseburger. I got the cheeseburger. Whoa, 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 whoa. death. Death of your desire for the cheeseburger, but also just, <laughs> you know, actual death. So each one of these drives Dude. is a death drive. Yes, absolutely. And this is, again, we are talking extremely practically because um, like, and this is like maybe, okay, I don't, I'm not going to name names, but okay, a, a very close relative of mine um, did die because mm. they could not let go of their alcohol oscillation. Mm. So insert cheeseburger, insert alcohol. Yeah. And he was literally told if you don't stop drinking alcohol like it's water, you are yeah. going to die. Yeah. And he decided not to let go of alcohol. So yeah. basically it becomes death. So yeah. what are we talking about with these fixations? Mm -hmm. What are we talking about when it comes to the cheeseburger, the Nike shoe, the, uh, the guru? There are different levels of the oscillation, but they're different ways to not confront your own death. But they are also different ways to transcend. <laughs> like if, also, if, if we take out, if we take out our judgment and we just look at it as, as oscillations, you know, not to not not to not to say something too racy right now, but but the desire to just get to that state, to that compressed totality DMT total alcoholized state, or total DMT state, or totally realized state, oscillation wise, they all look the same. They all look the same. There is the I, same desire. They're to, the same to sublate, sublimate, to become compressed, to dissolve, to Absolutely. unify ourselves. And uh, yeah. So if, I, if, I if you are, that. if you are loving, if you are loving the cheese, you can love the cheeseburger or the alcohol bottle in the same way that you love another person. It's yeah. the same in terms of the, like, cause when you're talking about the oscillation, you're talking about a physical description of this phenomenon. And this physical description is in some the form of this physical description manifests in the same way whether like the object is superficial yes and, like and, but and, but there are different level I, I i have to say that there are different levels of the dialectic of the oscillation of like course. i would say like i would say that the food drive or the love drive or the divine society drive they're different they're different levels yeah and you can you can we can judge them subjectively uh so for instance i was a, a drug addict and I went through that oscillation I, and I knew I, I might die, right? And I went through it and then I just escaped it, just barely escaped it. And now having escaped it and done another sort of dialectical, you know, pirouette and, uh, and then I had to, and then I left AA and just uh, escaped sort of like, you know, all of these, all of these shifts, all of these transcendencies <laughs> are um, in my subjective view, the, each zero, each projection, each uh, transcendent uh, state is greater than the next. Um, yes. Or sorry, each one is greater than the one prior. So and, I'm saying, how far does this go? Well, <laughs> I would like to. So, so can we talk about Plato for a second? Just yeah. Because okay, but this is this is also a prelude to a conversation about Plato. But we can start now. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so I was looking back on some of our uh, uh, correspondences a long time ago where I mentioned something about synthomes being reduced from analyzable. Uh, so, so in language, Lacan taking like the idea of a analyzable statements or analyzable words or an analyzable uh, symbols and them being reduced to unanalyzable uh, symbols, which, which he called synthomes. And the idea that, well, that has a lot of... Um, of correspondence with this idea of compression, compressing an idea and also entropy, um, informational entropy in information theory. The more, you know, the game of telephone moves along, the more information is lost, the more that piece of information is reduced and reduced and reduced and compressed until it's just basically a meme, right? It's just this thing that's unanalyzable that contains a universe of meaning, but is no longer sort of uh, explicitly nuanced. It's now this compressed form. So when I, I was going through all that and I said, which none of all of which does not not recall the platonic forms. And uh, and we and we got into this sort of conversation about uh, the platonic forms. Right. So when 
<laughs> this is so, but, yeah, so interesting. Yeah, yeah. So when we think about, you know, each compression, so the oscillation, compression, um, and then the oscillation, compression, and in the context of a relationship, oh, this woman, she's amazing. I'm in love, I'm in love, oxytocin, I, I mean, sorry, um, you know, uh, whatever the fuck. Um, uh, dopamine, 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 dopamine expires around year four, apparently, right? The dopamine expires and then vasopressin and oxytocin are supposed to, that's the new oscillation. And you start to get partnership and then, you know, those are happening and then, I don't know, you have a baby or whatever the case is, but you end up creating these new zero points and new zero points and each one is a stabilizing and larger than the one preceding it. And the oscillations that happen over the next zero point are larger and would have been distortions in the previous reality tunnel. So, you know, when you're just in love, you can't think, you can't imagine sort of being like 80 years old and you guys are on the porch. I mean, you can imagine it, but you can't enact it. That would be a distortion of your reality. Right now you're in love and that's your oscillation. And then you start stacking up these zeros. So the idea of like, where do these compressions head? And then we keep in mind this idea of, you know, the reduction of an idea and the synthome and also gravity and the reduction of space and the pulling in of space, a black hole creating these, these really super tight uh, Planck stars, which are compressions of information. Like think of a universal zip drive com compressing like an entire galaxy into a space like uh, 10 to the minus 10th uh, centimeter. Um, yeah. Something like that. And um, just I incredible. I'm with you, man. I'm with you. Okay. So yeah, anyway, you have these compressions and um, by the way, I just, this is not going too far. The way those Planck stars are created is by bigger and bigger suns, bigger and bigger suns exerting more and more pressure on the, the, the core of the sun. And there's a black hole. And so then that core, this Planck star, is this sort of like suddenly draws in everything. And, um, and you end up with these compressed universes inside this tiny space. So when we think about like, well, where do these compressions lead in our own life? What are we, let's say this, this conversation, let's say we get a million views with this conversation. The more this conversation is viewed, <laughs> yeah, good. the more this conversation is viewed, the more information within this conversation is going to be lost. The more unanalyzable this conversation will become, the more of a meme this conversation will become, the more reduced and compressed this conversation will become with the more attention put on this conversation. Yeah. So the Which is why certain sort of like, why certain, certain intellectual rock stars become memes and exactly. they become reduced to very simple, simplistic explanations where really, of course, their thought is much more complex than the meme. Yes, exactly. And Plato being maybe one of the most prime examples. Plato is the ultimate meme. Right, he's like. <laughs> yeah, oh, <laughs> philosophers just know. compress him to a ridiculous level. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so what I like about Plato is he's got this sort of double entendre going where it's like, you know, he is sort of probably, probably in a way because of his notion of platonic forms and then because it's Plato and so old and it's been so passed along and so reduced, like the perfect sort of uh, example of like, uh, you know, a compression. A, a syntho meme, what I was calling it, but maybe that's too complex. Dude. But just anyway, so this no, idea no, of dude. where do like these your, your line of thinking is, to me, your line of thinking is, is I mean, it's so, for me, it's so interesting. I mean, it's it's gold to me. I, I, I'm I totally trying to think along this this same line and this sort of meta paradox of Plato as an embodied historical thinker is that he becomes a platonic form in some sense, like yes. as, <laughs> as, as a, a, in philosophy, like, yeah. And and even th this this Platonic form as Plato himself becomes the point of negativity upon which other thinkers start their entire philosophical project. Yes, like like many major philosophers in the last two centuries have used Plato as a point of negativity from which to then articulate their own philosophy. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, but this but this this compression where you become uh, unanalyzable. And this notion of the synthome, and this is crucial for Lacan with the synthome, is that the synthome is something that the subject enjoys to repeat. So it just keeps enjoying it, and it's this, and it's this form which the subject will privilege over its own life. So, for example, in the example of my in the in in the example of my my family member who chose alcohol over life, the the repetition of alcohol was so 
he was basic. That was basically his platonic form, and mm -hmm. he would rather have that form yeah. than have life. Well, so so, so we the, were the question is how, how deep can that be pushed without dying? Well, so we were talking about uh, time earlier and eternalization, and then I was talking about these these frequencies, kind of you're compressing time for for people, or really when you're inside the frequency. Um, let's say time are these dots. And then you have these frequencies, your normal time. But then you start going like this. You start experiencing much more time within the same amount of time. So you start eternalizing uh, or feeling eternalized. So talking about Plato and talking about things being passed along, and they get more and more reduced, more and more compressed. Well, those compressions represent this sort of oscillation and compression and negation of time. Fame is probably the most famous immortalizer. Um, becoming famous, the more and more your name, your image, whatever it is getting passed along, the more of a meme you become, the more energy and attention being pushed into you, the more compressed uh, your likeness becomes, the more eternalized your likeness becomes. You aren't the compression, but the image, the projection of you is the compression. And you may try and keep up with that projection. I mean, I think that's the big problem with becoming famous is that you are not famous, your likeness is famous, and then you must keep up with that likeness. Absolutely. <laughs> you, that becomes your projection to sort of keep yeah. up with. But anyway- which, so is why, which is why I think I would prefer in some way that this conversation and even my identity stays sort of, I, I'm happy with it being just close to my body, let's say. Right, right, right. Resembling the oscillations of our bodies. Um, so, but at the same time, um, you know, these, these compressions do contain the nuance or they do contain something. They're, they, they, they are compressions um, that uh, subject- They're the historicity no of perfect contain. form. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 and the fact that they're eternalized, so- what I was mentioning in that in that in that correspondence, like almost a year ago now, was that this idea. Let's just say Plato. Plato has been eternalized vis-a-vis -vis the compression of like the fame of Plato, um, compressed. And what he has to forego is the nuance of Plato. But in exchange, yes. he is eternalized. Now, that sort of hyper object or whatever you want to call this thing that is Plato that now exists as a platonic form um, still contains Plato. And yeah. if it reaches some sort of Planck length compression, we'll have a sort of ironic return. Just like when Planck length compressions compress whole galaxies at, at Planck scale or when they start to approach uh, apoptotically um, uh, zero, they expand again, they, they, they burst and they create a rebound. And perhaps we are uh, investigating that rebound or catalyzing that rebound right now. But, um, but anyway, so yeah, I don't know. I totally just follow this. Music. Yeah. No, I, I follow this. And like the way I'm gonna like bounce off it immediately is like in, in music, I think oftentimes what I hear expressed in the music is the desire for this eternalization to occur. Like yeah. the like and, and, and like the the expression of one, the the oscillation of the musician is this enormous pain about time, um, and about the finitude and about the mortality of time and, and this desire for um again eternity, like and I'm just saying this off of like for example, just because it's exactly in the, the cultural landscape right now, but I just listened to uh Donda. Uh, Kanye's new album uh, for the first time yesterday and, and and well I'll just say quickly that the title track for Donda is obviously for his mother but the entire track is basically Kanye saying forever like he's basically trying to lift Donda mm. to the level of glory of forever and he's just repeating the word forever mm. he's just saying forever 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 and he's yeah. but he's basically trying to eternalize he's trying to create a symptom yeah. He's trying to create a little packet of, of information. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, you that know, that's unanalyzable. Donda. So when, 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 um, 
when um, uh, Homer is writing about Achilles and Achilles wants to be a hero more than anything, Achilles wants to be immortal. That's why he's being a hero. And he goes on to the battlefield and Achilles does his heroics specifically so that the muses will sing about him after he dies. But crucially, Achilles needs the muses, he needs a medium to eternalize him. And so th this whole idea of the medium being the sort of immortalizer, uh, you know, whatever the case. Um, and now that we live in a totally mediated world um, where everything, you know, we're not just getting 15 minutes of fame, we're getting our immortality by being on these immortality machines, even though this particular talk probably, you know, won't be Donda, right? But it is sort of um, immortalizing itself on some level. And this, 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 well, my 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 immortal my my immortalization drive would be at the moment in the sphere of philosophy, and yours would be, I'm supposing, music. But you're transitioning to philosophy as well. Sure. I mean, I, I'm I'm. This is all. Everything is art to me. So, like, you know, it's like, art. Yeah. It, it's all about what what's inspiring. Um, you know, like for instance, the fact you know, like you were noting, like it's very funny that I'm talking about magnetic zeros in a philosophical context. <laughs> it's very, it's very wild because it initially started as a math, as like this pendulum math. But anyway, coming to me, this is music, right? We're having this correspondence. It's fucking. It's music. It's whatever, whatever it is. It's getting our rocks off. But it's exciting. That's the most important thing, and um, and it's doing something that feels visceral. Um, and, and yet we're doing it on this eternalizing medium. And um, there's something within that where we are, we're creating the preconditions that this could become a synthomene, that this could last, uh, to use your last name, that this uh, could, could eventually sort of, um, you know, get passed along and reduced and reduced and reduced and become a sort of platonic form in a sense. And the reason... Um, or, or, or it seems that the reason we give things names, the philosophy of lack, the reason we give it a name is so that it can be passed along, is so yeah. that it can be memorized, is so that it become, can become a meme, is so that it can then become eternalized, is so that it can eventually become a platonic form, so that it can eventually survive whatever heat death or, um, you know, death of the universe, so that it can then sort of rebound um, in the next universe or whatever the fucking case, whatever our compulsion to create these sort of compressions is, is very interesting in and of itself. And it seems to be everywhere. Everywhere we look, the desire to compress with another, the desire to create compressions of information with by giving it a name and so that it can be passed along and, and create entropy and then be reduced. It's fucking everywhere. And it's fascinating. I think it's I think it's 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 so central and this this idea that I think the crucial idea that we want to communicate to the people listening either now or after is this idea that we're talking about platonic forms in a very historical sense in a very becoming sense which is which is obvious which is obviously not how usually people talk about platonic forms usually people do not talk about platonic forms as in a genesis or as in a right. process of becoming right. they talk about the platonic forms as if they already exist like the textbook right. example that you'll hear in a university textbook is uh that there's an ideal form of a horse and that the actual horses reflect this ideal form of the horse which the ideal form of the horse doesn't exist in history right and that almost that this ideal form has an existence outside of history whereas what we're saying is that something in history becomes a platonic form that's mysterious what the hell's going on there we don't think about that yes and i'm saying that my my family member who decided to choose death over life was basically choosing a platonic form over life yes he was choosing the form of the alcohol how, how does something become that now okay for the alcohol we can have an easier explanation of why that becomes a platonic form. For someone like Osho, who basically was turning himself into a platonic form of some type that wants to be passed on, the last words he said is, I leave you my dream, is more mysterious. What's going on there? That's a higher order oscillation. That's much more difficult to achieve 
than to die with the alcohol bottle. Yeah. Now, for, now, now, for for on now, like to put some deeper philosophical context on what we're talking about, Hegel would say that the pathways of the absolute were art, philosophy, and religion, so that you could choose to turn yourself into a Platonic form of an artistic form, of a philosophical form, or a religious form. So, for example, like you could say, for example, David Bowie with his album Black Star. Was, was doing just that. Uh, you could say Socrates, with the way he died, was doing just that. Um, you could say Jesus, with the way he died, was doing just that in the religious field. So do, do you see, now I'm putting David Bowie, Socrates, and Jesus together, but who, okay. But this, no, is, no. That, this is that general. They're all, they're, they're all, they're all exist. Like the guy who self who self immolated in uh, the monk who self immolated in protest to Vietnam is a is a uh, The uh, Jimi Hendrix uh, dying on his puke. All of these things are 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 reduction are, are platonic forms to somebody. They're you know what I mean. They 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 have varying levels of gravity. Jesus has like this exponential uh, level of sort of compressed gravity to him. Um, and you have these, these this sort of constellation of uh, gravitational forms being created, being reduced, being compressed, and then existing as constellations in our human psyche. Absolutely. You know? And you could even say that there are levels to this compression. So like in the example of Jesus being one of the most hyper compressed objects, uh, gravitationally speaking, again, when I was listening to the album Donda, Kanye was referring to Jesus constantly so you can have Kanye so you can have Kanye as a compression in music but because he's constantly referring to Jesus you could say Jesus is a more compressed form than Kanye and then oh. you could have lo and for for example but there are I'm just trying to say that there are levels to this compression process well and also you could you, you, you see the um, the gravitation uh, of, of Jesus and and of Kanye uh, acquiring gravity simultaneously because they're in sort of a relation because he's referring to him and and you can't think of one without the other he's in a fucking like little mini church for fuck's sake so you know it's he he's piggybacking off the compression of one thing and uh, and 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 acquiring more compression vis-a-vis -vis that compression and and that example is a good example of why i'm saying that relationalism has to be contextualized in the situation of the relation to the non-relation because Kanye and Jesus have a certain relation to the non-relation, and you can't understand their relation without the non-relation. Say that again. Like I'm saying that relationalism. Oh, sure, like, sure, sure, basically, sure. you're saying you're saying Kanye and Jesus are related. You but mean I'm saying relation as the compression. You you can't. Well, one Jesus has a relation to the non-relation, which is his historical performance and the way he died. He formed a relation to the non-relation. In terms of the way he died. By by non-relation, do you mean because when I think of non-relation, I mean of total relation as the zero, like the compressed state? Is that what you mean by non-relation, or what do you mean by non non-relation? Well, that's we already we already we already covered that a little bit with the idea that the ultimate compression might be death itself. Yes, and is that what you mean by non-relation? Yeah, when I say non-relation, well, when I'm talking non-relation in this context i am talking about it in that context like where jesus had a certain relation to non-relation kanye has a certain relation to non-relation and you can't under you can't understand the relation between them without the non-relation if you just have the relations you're not understanding the transcendent dimension yeah if that makes sense i think so yeah um and also what you're implying in a certain sense is an awareness on the part of all of these um you know uh aspiring platonic forms uh, of human, um, a, a, a contextual awareness of the power of, I mean, you know, uh, Jesus essentially was very willing to die on the cross, uh, probably in part because he knew the kind of compression that that would create. Um, and, uh, and obviously Kanye uh, is doing the same thing by having Marilyn Manson and various other, you know, um, you know uh, uh, canceled uh, figures uh, with him and, you know, in a church and whatever the case, whatever the various uh, things he's attempting to do to create uh, strange attractors is also very much aware 
Um, these are not things that, I mean, in fact, I, I believe I, I read some press release where he's like, yes, Kanye knows that these are very, uh, 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 you know, um, uh, he had, he had, he had, he had, he had Marilyn Manson and the baby right. on a track. Right. Both of, both of them are canceled. Right. And, and his press secretary, sec his PR person was like, yes, Kanye knows, blah, blah, blah. They're controversial. That's the whole point. Yada, yada. Exactly. That's the whole point. It, it's just about sort of acquiring attention, creating more compression and eternalizing oneself um, more and more uh, and becoming eventually sort of untouchable, uh, unanalyzable, untouchable, Michael Jackson, Jesus, whatever the case. Um, you know, Michael Jackson's a really good example. This guy al almost certainly was molesting kids. I mean, I, you know, I, I'd say that's pretty fucking clear. <laughs> and yet, like, you know, to, to hear uh, Aziz Ansari say it, he's like, yeah, but I'm still going to listen to him. I have a wedding to go to. <laughs> you know, it's like somehow this guy has, and, and I can't listen to Michael Jackson without thinking about it, but I know many people who complete, like, they still blast Michael Jackson without without any thought. And um, and that's because he, he eternal he, he surpassed any of these nuanced and the information. Those became irrelevant because of the gravity of the compression of Michael Jackson. Now, it's, this is not saying anything about that specific example, but I will say that in some sense, the individual who has compressed themselves is um, operating in a space beyond good and evil. and they ha and you cannot produce the highest good you cannot produce the highest good without at least being in touch with your deepest evil that's what like that's what Nietzsche is saying with good and evil that is like that they're they're saying they're the same thing it's just that evil needs to be sublated evil needs to be 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 sublimated it, you you have to be in touch with the core of your being yeah which I'm not sure Michael Jackson was but but no, Michael I, Jackson I, wasn't. That's why I didn't want to use that example in particular of Michael Jackson. But he is operating uh, uh, post mortem in a in a place beyond good and evil for most people. I mean, like and yeah. But in terms of his actual was, life, actually, he was disconnected from that because he was just much. puppet strings the entire time. Yeah, yeah, very much disconnected, but somehow so compressed that the projection of Michael Jackson, which again, Michael Jackson was not. Michael Jackson was trying to keep up with the projection. Um, the projection of Michael Jackson. Um, which becomes the synthome, um, was such that it was operating outside the scope of good and evil. It was beyond it. Yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. That's yeah. what I mean. And, and like, and I think for sure, Kanye is probably more directly interacting with that space. I think Jesus was certainly interacting with something outside of that space of beyond good and evil. So it's just that in order to become this compressed thing, this unanalyzable synthome, I think by definition, you're operating beyond good and evil. Unanalyzable means you're operating beyond good and evil. Yes, yes, yes. We're on the yeah. same page with that. Yeah. yeah. So maybe just to summarize some of these ideas about the, the synthome and the platonic form and the unanalyzability, I think that like at least what what I'm saying, or like I'm probably the same thing you're saying is, is that um, I think you turn yourself into a true infinity, meaning you take something, you, you, you exit the spurious infinity of constantly trying to be magnetized by something outside of yourself, whether it's the hamburger, the Nike shoe, the, the bottle, you make yourself the magnetic zero. Yeah. That becomes the compression. You yeah. are so, you become so compressed that to the outsider, you're unanalyzable. Mm. And you're just mysterious. Like I've had, for example, on a lower level, like um, people sort of relate to me or come up to me as like, I can't, I don't know everything you're doing. I can't follow everything you're doing. I don't really know, like, but because you're, you become compressed to the point of un unanalyzability and yeah. you, you can't be easily summarized. You can't be easily packaged. Whereas um, I think that. Part, the, part of it. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. But that, just that you, you you compress you compress yourself to unanalyzability, and that's the historicity of the Platonic form that you become in whatever sphere you're in: philosophy, art, religion. Yeah, and and what's interesting about that, on the flip side, you become analyzable, which gives you a, a sort of free pass in a sense, because you can you become less and less knowable, which is sort of the down flip side of that. 
So, you know, someone comes up and they're like, oh, wow, blah, 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 blah. You're this compressed thing, this, this sort of idealistic form, but then you also feel less knowable and it sort of um, isolates, uh, isolates you. So I, I think that, you know, and that, that's obviously consistent with a, the experience of fame for a lot of people is this sense of like um, increased isolation. Well, I can give a few examples of that. I mean, you might even want to speak to that a little bit because like I could say, for example, in terms of how I, in terms of how I've related to you, I actually, when I first started relating to you, I didn't know you were Edward Sharp and the Magnetic Zeros. I was just interacting with you as Alex Ebert, but I'm sure a lot of people do interact with you as Edward Sharp and the Magnetic Zeros and that that creates this feeling of people don't really know me. Yeah, uh, and also it dislocates my my sense of myself, and so the self that I, I I become confused as to which or or I do not know which me they are relating to, and so it creates this sort of dislocated sense of trust, um, and so that that can end up feeling isolating. And one of the reasons I like um, operating in the world of philosophy is that number one. My whatever cachet I have will only go so far in the world of philosophy. Uh, the you know the ideas have to somehow stand um, in some sense. It's it's like when I was um, started scoring movies, and um, and I was I suddenly was in this room of composers and John Williams and and Hans Zimmer and these guys they're not famous famous but they're they're just not concerned with that. And the awards they get aren't necessarily based on their names. It's like about the art form and the cachet only goes so far. And, you know, so there's realms to operate in that are less sort of fame hungry um, than sort of the pop world. So I've, I've found that for, 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 for not just the reasons that I'm having sort of like philosophical ideas and that that's what's most intriguing to me right now, but I'm also drawn because I'm being related to based on uh, merits that um, are uh, dislocated from whatever fame I've acquired. And so there's more of a sense of trust in the interactions for me. Yeah, that's what I was trying. That's what I was trying to get at. Yeah. That's yeah. what I was trying to get at. Yeah. And I could imagine that being actually quite, um, I don't know if the right word's annoying, but it would be frustrating in some sense. I'm just trying to do them because I haven't really experienced it probably on the level that you have, but I, I definitely see how it could create this gap where I don't trust. I don't trust the people that are relating to me because they're, re they're relating to an image, which is so disembodied from what I actually am that there's no even point of relating. Yeah. And that I, I that I can't live up to and all that, but I think that I'm in the middle of a process of negating the, the negation. So I've negated the sort of fame thing, and I'm like, okay, I can't trust any of uh, so and so, and I can't, and I, and I sort of have recoiled. But I'm in the process of sort of getting right with that and being like, well, that stuff that they're judging me on is stuff that came from me. It is me on a level, um, the projections and all that shit, like whatever. But um, there is sort of like a, it's a long loop process but slowly i'm starting to feel myself get right with that and come back around to a place where i might be willing to like tour and play again but the fact is that speaking of compression when you have sixty thousand eyeballs on you at once and you're on stage and sixty thousand people are focused on you at once you start to compress and it's it's I, and yeah. you do that year in year out for, yeah. for nine years um you become less analyzable to yourself and um it's a very strange feeling and um and i think that that's why you know famous people they start to only relate and date with other famous people because they're like oh my god i can't i can't trust <laughs> like i need to i need to hang out with someone else who's just as compressed um and then absolutely we, uh, like unravel our nuance in private um but yeah so it's a it's an interesting i do it I I do experience that. I do experience that in the context of like academic presentations. Like if you're in a certain room, if you're in a certain environment, if you're in a certainly that it's, it's it might be more the the quality of the environment that's compressing you than the quantity because it might just be like fifty to a hundred people. But if it's in a certain academic environment, you 
you know that these 50 to 100 people hold a lot of intellectual weight. But there's just like this feeling of being on stage in that environment where the compression is enormous. And there are certainly spaces of compression that I've operated in in, in my 30s that I would not have been able to operate in in my 20s. Like when yeah. I'm in a room with like the, you know, the, I don't know, like the, the, the greatest evolutionary theorists of our era are all in the same room and I'm giving a presentation and they're listening to me. When I was 20, I could not have handled that level of compression. Yeah. yeah. You know, and the and and here's, I guess, my inner test with that is my capacity to be in a sort of dynamic flow and a type of like in the way I'm talking right now when I'm in that compressed environment is sort of like my inner test for whether or not I have sort of, um, I don't know, like in, internalize that idealization to a healthy level. Like, because if the ideal or the projection is too strong in my head, then I won't even be able to perform at all. Yeah. Well, I think that that's why it's really helpful to blow up the ideal from time to time. Uh, to totally get rid of it get rid of it, uh, play with, you know, and that's one of the fun things about it is you can, you can end up then playing with that and, uh, and blowing it up, uh, showing up in your fucking underpants and do the presentation. Um, whatever the case is like, you know, just, just blowing it up. Um, and, and, and then that in and of itself becomes a dialectic, a dialectic with the expectation and, um, and with failure. Uh, because if, if there's, you know, failure is one of the most invigorating things. So almost sort of, you know, doing the unexpected uh, because the, the uh, one of the com main compressions is the expectation and to uh, to to sort of blow that up uh, is and 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 manufacture failure um, is uh, is helpful yeah um, yo Cadell I have to get the let's, I have to get out let's, of the Airbnb. Let's, let's let's sum let's summarize then let's summarize and end so we're we're talking about we're talking about lack. Um, this is in the context of a series on, on the philosophy of lack. Um, I think that what I wanted to emphasize in this conversation is to go a little bit deeper into our thinking about the non-relation. Um, and I mean, I, I feel like, I feel like we, we did that. So um, is there anything you wanted to, to say before sort of closing up? Um. Yeah, just a last thing, you know, um, I really like the superposition of non-relation, total relation as the same thing. Um, and, and so that so that people can think of, you know, you have a red dot on screen, another red dot on screen, another red dot on screen. You see that you see the relationship between these dots. The only thing that is zero, because there's nothing in the universe that is nothing, that is actually an actual void. The only way then to get to nothing is to go to everything so that you fill the screen with red so that you can no longer differentiate one red dot from another. And that's sort of the immersion of the self with the universe, the, um, the encompassing sort of effect of the DMT experience. And so to, to, to begin to think of zero as not a, um, an absence of everything, but rather as a compression of something and that we can start to sort of, relate to nothing in a different way. All right. Um, I definitely uh, enjoy this synergy of thinking non-relation and total relation as the same thing. Um, I think it's it's definitely uh, intellectually stimulating. Um, in that context, I tried to emphasize that death as the ultimate non-relation is the same thing as a sort of totalizing relation. Um, and that's interesting to think about the dialectics of life and also the historicity of Platonic form, which I think it went. And just for those of you who are watching and are sort of watching this as a sort of continuous project, um, hopefully in the next conversation on philosophy of lack, we're actually going to start with Plato and talk about perfect form. So this was, I'm glad we had a chance to do this conversation because we had a chance to go a little bit deeper into how we're trying to think that. Um, so thank you for being here, and uh, I'm just going to end the, uh, the live stream. Awesome. Thank Peace you. out.